Hello and welcome to this episode of IMEC TV. My name's Dr. Jen Baxter and I am the Chief Engineer at the Institution of Mechanical Engineers. And I'm here today with Dr. Tim Fox, who is Chair of our Process Industries Division and also one of the main authors of a report that we released last year on sea level rises. So thank you, Tim, for being here and taking the time to talk to us. Can you tell us a little bit about the report that you produced last year? Yes, of course. And uh, thank you for having me on, on the show. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, the first thing to understand is that um, sea level isn't an absolute, that um, over geological time, sea level rises and falls with the variations in the amount of ice that's on the planet. So as the ice freezes, sea level goes down, and as the ice thaws, sea level goes up. And that's a perfectly normal natural cycle, um, and we've been experiencing that for millions of years. So um, we've, we're, we're sitting in an interglacial at the moment between two ice ages, and um, sea level during that period appears to be absolute. Um, but of course, um, we're now in a slightly different epoch in that uh, the effects of global warming and climate change mean that potentially the amount of frozen ice on the planet is going to change quite dramatically um, in the coming centuries, indeed, uh, potentially in the coming decades. And that'll mean that we might see some significant changes of sea level um, during the uh, lifetime of a lot of the infrastructure and engineered um, buildings, et cetera, that we, that we construct and, and operate, maintain and decommission. So we're entering a new epoch where potentially we as engineers have to deal with a completely different um, set of design criteria where sea level might, might change significantly instead of uh, remaining uh, stable over that period of time. So that, that's essentially the background to the, the work that we did. Thanks, Tim. And I know that you produced this with other members of the institution. And can you tell me a bit about the decision making process? Why did you and other members feel that this was something that the institution should tackle? Yes. So um, there's about a year and a half ago, uh, we, we became, myself and some other members uh, in particular, became aware of an emerging body of work, uh, emerging, emerging body of evidence from around the world, from very reputable board, uh, organizations that um, was beginning to indicate that sea level might rise quite uh, uh, significantly more than the International Panel on Climate Change has been projecting. So um, the, the current worst case uh, scenario from the IPCC is a sea level rise of about one metre over the course of the century, which in, its, in itself is quite significant. Um, particularly organisations involved with uh, studying the polar ice caps um, have uh, been indicating that that sea level rise might be significantly underestimated. Uh, for example, the North American Organization for Atmosphere has been in indicating that the sea level rise might, in might be as high as 2.7 meters by the end of the century. So the sea level rise will largely come from melting of the sea ice in Antarctica um, and Greenland. So we we came together, myself and uh, Frank Mills, to set up a project to collaborate on um, uh, going through an initial scoping exercise of trying to understand how, as a profession, we should approach this challenge. And the work was funded by the Technology uh, Strategy Board of the Institution of Mechanical Engineers, and it involved um, not only uh, members of our boards, but also we brought in other boards from across the institution um, and indeed, we uh, engaged our technical centres overseas, including the India Technical Centre of the Process Industries Division in India, to get um, to get a global perspective. And it is a process, isn't it? When you produce a report like this at the institution, we have to go through a number of different tasks in order to come to a final result. So can you tell me what you did in order to get the data that you needed to understand what was going on in those different areas and, and how you actually formulated the report itself? And did you find out anything that was unexpected in that process? Yes. Yeah, so as you say, uh, Jen, it's quite a, there's quite a significant process involved in coming uh, to the point at which we can publish one of those reports. Um, the first thing we have to do, of course, is identify the areas of knowledge that, that we don't have um, uh, in, in, within our profession and seek external help for that. So um, to provide a robust evidence base for that, 
we enlisted the help of uh, John Englander, who's a um, internationally recognized um, expert on sea level rise based in Florida in the United States. So we engaged the, um, engaged the power industries division um, and uh, we, we engaged uh, organizations outside the institution, including uh, MR, MRS, the Institute, uh, Institution of Marine Engineers, Scientists and Technologists. Um, and uh, the chemical engineers and other other uh, other engineer uh, others in our sister organizations to come together to bring their perspective to the table as well so then to go through a process of evidence gathering we undertook and f uh, facilitated a large number of workshops um both in the uk uh, and um, in india uh, uh to uh solicit um reaction to to the challenge that was laid out by our, our sea level rise experts um, so in the end, you you end up with a report that uh, truly does represent um, the engineering profession or the IMEC -E, uh, the, the mechanical engineering profession's um, response to this uh, to this challenge in the context of the challenge laid out by the experts that we enlisted to help. So some of the findings in the report were quite frightening. You know, a sea level rise of almost three meters is quite significant. So from your personal perspective and your experience of going through this process, what do you see as the biggest challenge for us as engineers as the sea levels do rise? So the absolutely biggest challenge that we discovered, uh, Jen, was that um, it, it, it really sits within the uncertainty of the instability of the ice sheets in Antarctica and Greenland. So um, the, the, the mechanisms are very poorly understood. Um, as to how and when these uh, ice uh, sheets uh, uh, might begin to uh, collapse and uh, lead to fairly large uh, and significant rises in sea level. Um, and that causes us as engineers a great deal of, um, of uh, challenges and problems around how to design for that degree of uncertainty. We've been so conditioned to design within fairly certain boundary conditions and fairly certain um, uh, data, cons da data envelopes that um, you know, our, all, our, all our design methodologies are based on uh, historical backward looking data um, that seeks to, de seeks to define um, parameters that are stable. Um, but of course, this uncertainty presents us with a, a real challenge and, and how we, how we um, Re, um, resolve the tension between that uncertainty and the economic impact of de the decisions we're making. So um, if we decide, for example, um, to design a seawall sea one meter higher to allow for uh, this uh, potential sea level rise, um, then that has obviously significant economic effects um, in terms of the cost of the seawall, the return on the investment over what time scale, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and of course, it's very difficult to um, to, to to find a a route through that tension, so that's that's the key nub of the challenge for for us as engineers is the uncertainty rooted in that instability in Antarctica and Greenland. And I guess that the report's recommendations built on that sort of fundamental area. So can you tell us what the key recommendations from the report were? Yes. Yeah, so we made three recommendations in the report, Jen. Um, and uh, the first one was uh, a call to government to um, recognize the uh, emerging and increasing evidence base that sea level uh, may potentially rise by a, a significant amount more than has previously been anticipated. Uh, the second was an ex uh, recommendation was an extension of that to, to ask that uh, government takes potentially significant levels of, of, of sea level rise into account when developing strategies for dealing with climate change and climate change adaptation and to account for the fact that this will have a significant impact not only on the built environment but also on the industrial infrastructure of of the uk um, and then the third recommendation was uh, for government to set up a a task force um, which uh, brings the professional engineering bodies like the Institution of Mechanical Engineers into a group uh, that um, that looks at these challenges in much greater detail, uh, uh, recognizing that our study was only a, an initial scoping study and develops pathways uh, to adaptation 
that um, that meets uh, all of the environmental, economic, uh, and other uh, and um, uh, environmental uh, considerations to find uh, sustainable adaptation pathways. So there's some strong recommendations there, and it, this is where the biggest challenge comes, isn't it? Taking those recommendations and driving them through governments policy and making those changes. So my final question really to you, Tim, is what's next? What do we do next to ensure that those recommendations that we as an institution make are followed up by governments? Yes. So um, actually, as part of the project, we were very cognizant of the fact that we would need to we would need to engage government and government agencies um, in uh, taking our work forward. And as part of that, we um, engage those um, departments and bodies in the actual work itself. So we had representatives from the Environment Agency um, uh, and the um, Infrastructure Commission, et cetera, involved actually in the workshops that we we undertook uh, to um, in, in begin that relationship and, and find a, a potential um, longer term route to uh, taking the work forward. And and that has indeed continued since the publication of the, the work. We've um, we've continued our engagement with the Environment Agency. They're very familiar with the work that we're doing, and we've been uh, providing further input into their strategies and thinking. Um, and we've been working with the National Inst Infrastructure Commission and um, a, a body called the uh, Infrastructure Operators Adaptation Forum that um, brings all of the UK's major infrastructure representatives from those uh, companies together and organizations together. Um, and we've been um, informing them of our work and, and looking to work uh, with them going forward. Um, so, uh, so yeah, it, and of course that's where as volunteers um, within the institution, um, it becomes uh, somewhat challenging because clearly there's a significant amount of volunteer work in producing the reports themselves but it's uh, it's a question then of sustaining that volunteer uh, commitment and contribution through uh, for the long haul in terms of we, the onward engagement um, it, it, with government um, so uh, that in itself is a it, it is a challenge in, in the work that we do at the institution. It is, but it's also, I think, our volunteers are one of our greatest strengths too. So being able to access all of the knowledge in the way that you did has really demonstrated some great recommendations and some great follow-up to that as well. So thank you very much, Tim. It's been a really informative and insightful discussion. And I want to say thank you to everybody who has tuned in to either watch or listen to us talking today. And we hope to see you all again soon. So that's it from us. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Goodbye.